Hi, I'm Ashley Howard, professor of African American history at the University of Iowa. And today we'll do our final installation on fabulous black women from Iowa who've made a difference in their communities. Did you know that Des Moines had a Black Panther Party? Today, we'll discuss Mary Rem and her impact on this important organization within the state of Iowa. Mary Rem was born in Arkansas and moved to Des Moines at the age of nine. She attended North High School on the city's north side, and upon graduation, she went to go visit her brother in Los Angeles. There, they attended Black Panther Party meetings, and she began to see their political education and think that this was something that would be really great to bring back to Des Moines so Black people there could learn a little bit about the organization and what they were doing. Now, Des Moines at this time had a number of problems. There was segregation, inadequate schools, inadequate job uh, opportunities, an interstate that went right through the Black community and bifurcated it, all of these things had an impact on how Black people in the Midwest, and particularly in Des Moines, lived their lives. And perhaps the best example of this happened with the Good Park Rebellion in 1966 on the 4th of July weekend. That weekend, there were a bunch of young Black kids who were participating in activities, recreational activities, at a swimming pool. And the police went to go break up the event and in the process used excessive force on these young people. And from there, an uprising took place. So at this time, Black Des Moines was really responsive and receptive to the type of ideas that Mary Rem would be bringing back with her from Los Angeles and applying to the lives of people there. Now, there are two kind of main people that come to be associated with the Black Panther Party in Des Moines. The first is Mary Rem and the other is Charles Knox. Rem first met Charles Knox on the corner of 13th and University in Des Moines. He was working there from Chicago with a program called VISTA. And this is one of these kind of anti-poverty programs of the 1960s that were really helping to get rid of some of the economic inequality that many Americans faced at this time. So on July 18th, 1968, Mary Rem, Charles Knox, and Michael Harris all filed incorporation documents with the Secretary of State of Iowa for what was known as the Black Panther Organization, Inc. And so what they really wanted to do was announce to the state that they were going to have a Black Panther Party chapter within the state. And what their kind of overall mission was with this entity was to promote implement and develop the well-being of the entire Black community in Iowa. And so on this kind of initial drafting document, there were 12 different people who were going to be the founding director, and of those 12 people, three were in fact Black women. Now, although Rem was the founder of the organization, right, it was her brainchild to bring the Black Panther Party to Des Moines, it was Charles Knox that became the public face of the organization. But Rem, like so many other women who were Panthers, had that kind of life-sustaining um, jobs of the organization. She ran the free breakfast program, which served over 300 children. She ran adult health programming, including driving um, people with substance abuse to a clinic in Kansas City. But what was really important was a lot of the inroads that she made with other Black women around poverty organizing, particularly Joanna Cheatham, who ran the Black Mobile Street Workers, which was a organization helping people advocate for better welfare rights within their community. Now, it's well known that the entire national Black Panther Party organization was really organized around 10 principles known as the party's 10-point platform. Now, the Des Moines chapter also really embodied these ideas and worked for those goals, especially around point number five, which is around education. 
And in fact, the Des Moines chapter led by REM found this idea of education to be so important that they expanded the 10 point party platform into a 16 point party platform, adding on additional avenues to think about the betterment of education for black youth within the state of Iowa. Particularly, the things that they wanted to get rid of, first of all, was the end of academic tracking. Oftentimes, even if schools were integrated, white children would be placed in kind of college track types of classes, whereas black children would be placed in manual labor or, you know, um, mechanical type of classes or special education classes, even if that wasn't the right fit for them. So they wanted to get rid of this tracking type of system. They also want a dismissal of all racist teachers and staff. And finally, something that REM and the Panther Party were advocating for was the creation of a Black Committee for Student Power. So they really wanted to enable young Black students to be their own advocate and to see the power, the collective power that they had within their school systems. Another of the plans that the Black Panther Party of Des Moines wanted to do was cultural education. And one of these was going to be coming through funding through the Greater Opportunities Incorporated. Now, this was a local organization that gave small grants, about $1,500, to community organizations to put on programming. And what the Black Panther Party wanted to do was to have a full African-American festival weekend with music, food, entertainment, arts, to really showcase Black community life and culture but this was a hotly contested proposal. In fact, while eight of the people on the commission said, yes, give them the money, this is wonderful, lots of other members on this commission had grave concerns. They wanted to have oversight on how the money was spent. They wanted to choose the volunteers that were going to work there. And the Black Panther Party only found out this information after they had sat vigil in front of the offices, 20 different Black Panthers, to find out what had happened to their application because it just languished there for months. Now, the Black Panther Party of Des Moines had an impact beyond just the metro area. In fact, they're building um, connections not only within the state, but also within the whole region. So they're part of one of the main fundraising activities of all Black Panther Party chapters were selling the national newspaper, the Black Panther. And so in that kind of work, they would go to Iowa City, they would go to Cedar Rapids, they would go to Waterloo and Davenport and sell the papers and really begin to talk about what the Panther Party does, what their objectives are, and to build allyship. And as a consequence of this kind of interaction, they actually bring in a number of white allies as supporters to the Black Panther Party um, objectives. So the Catholic Charities Organization in Des Moines actually gives them a building to run their headquarters out of. The Students for Democratic Society in Des Moines becomes one of their fiercest um, allies as well as the Iowa City Peace and Justice Coalition, uh, which would protest on their behalf right here in Iowa City. Within the region, because the Black Panther Party chapters tended to be a bit smaller than you would see, say, in Oakland or Chicago, they began to create intra-regional alliances. And so we see that they're beginning to create communities and communication with the Black Panther Party chapters in Omaha, Kansas City, and Des Moines. And so they're supporting one another by attending rallies, by sharing information, and really thinking about what the Black Panther Party um, means for people in the Midwest. And because of that, these Midwestern chapters aren't always you know, fall, falling into line with the national chapters, right? They feel it's oftentimes more important to give people a newspaper to learn about this information as opposed to selling um, that newspaper. And this kind of disconnect between the regional chapters and the national organization will play an outsized role in how this organizing and ultimately the demise of the Black Panther Party in Des Moines comes out.
So the end of the Black Panther chapter in Des Moines is the input of many things. So if we're thinking about kind of the national picture, the first is what we see is COINTELPRO or counterintelligence programs. This is being run out of the FBI. And it's this kind of idea that we have people embedded within these organizations, not just the Black Panther Party, but mainstream civil rights organizations, left-leaning student organizations on campus. And so they're taking in all of this information that's going on in these communities. And they're also engaging in some practices like bad jacketing, which is getting people to make bad decisions, right? So they are suggesting you know, hostile takeovers, they're suggesting violence. And so people are beginning to take the suggestions of federal agents and doing that. Um, and there's also within these COINTELPRO programs, a lot of um, misinformation that is going on. So sowing discontent between organizations and within organizations. So really destabilizing these organizations. So that's one thing that's going on at the national level. At the other kind of national level is there's discontent within the Black Panther organization. So they're growing rapidly in this kind of 1968, 1969 period. And it's difficult to manage all of these new chapters, especially if they're like the Midwestern chapters and are doing things a bit differently. So the national offices of the Black Panther Party begins to kind of kick out organizations, right, chapters, within uh, the Black Panther Party. So we see this actually happening in Omaha as well as Des Moines. Now at the local level, another major factor is going on at the Des Moines chapters. So lots of Des Moines Panthers are getting arrested, oftentimes for minor offenses that later get dropped. For instance, Mary Rem was protesting when Charles Knox was on trial and she showed up at the courthouse and she shouted out in support of her comrade and friend, and she uh, received a charge for disrupting the public. But what's really unique in the Des Moines case is their headquarters was destroyed. On April 26, 1969, a bomb went off um, at the Panther head headquarters, destroying the building and damaging about 50 other buildings nearby. While nobody was injured or killed in the bombing, as people were fleeing the headquarters, police stopped and maced them, right? So they escaped one danger only to run into another bodily threat. And to this day, there is no idea of who actually committed this, this act of arson. The police blamed the Black Panther Party, saying that they were behind the destruction, and the Black Panther Party um, what blamed the police, saying either that they did it themselves or that they knew who did it and didn't do anything to stop it. So within this picture of the national discord happening in the Black Panther Party, the very intentional aims of the federal government to disrupt any of this kind of organizing, plus individual members going to jail, plus the bombing of the headquarters, it was difficult for the Black Panther Party in Des Moines to sustain itself. So in 1970, it reimagined itself, right? A lot of the same leadership, but under a new name, the Revolutionary Communist Youth. And they organized for a few more years under this kind of title. Um, but by the time we get to the early 70s, as an entity, the Des Moines Black Panther Party um, is by and large defunct. But just because the organization ceased to exist as an actual entity didn't mean that the people who were involved in it didn't keep organizing. Many of the members of the Black Panther Party continue to organize in their communities in Des Moines today, especially Mary Rep. She later changed her name to Sister Hadasha, and she worked within her community, particularly around poverty rights for the next 40 years. Um, most specifically with the Oak Ridge Neighborhood Services, serving impoverished people, many of whom were African-American, um, until she passed away in 2011. And so while the Panther, Black Panther Party organization may no longer be around in that entity, their legacy is long-serving in thinking about education, thinking about access to healthcare, 
thinking about access to clean and healthy food. All of these things really undergird how community organizations today seek to serve their populations and bring everybody together to work for the common good. 